always rough, always rugged, sometimes Wyoming, up here at the clinic. And it's a lovely Saturday. It is November 8th, 2025. I wanted to make a video talk about something that everybody's talking about because finally, 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 we have an objective source of truth. So you will see across the internet, the media, uh, you'll see across the markets, everybody talking about quantum computing. And they say, oh, when quantum computers come, they're going to destroy us. They're going to burn humanity down. Or quantum computers will create a utopia. Uh, quantum computers are going to do all kinds of interesting things. Uh, or they're complete scams and they don't exist and uh, they never will exist. So our good friends at DARPA uh, decided to actually definitively answer this question once and for all. And the way they're going to answer this question is through a program called DARPA QBI. I really wish they would do this for the blockchain space. I've been lobbying very heavily through every channel we got. Uh, but this is something that's really special. And I wanted to share it all with you because it's a way to create objective reality with things. Okay, so as of November 6, 2025, DARPA has selected 11 companies that are the second stage, uh, stage B of the agency's QBI initiative, which aims to rigorously verify and validate whether any quantum computing approach can achieve utility scale operation, meaning its computational value exceeds its cost by the year 2023, 2033, okay? So less than 10 years from now, about eight years. As QBI continues, DARPA anticipates additional teams to advance to stages A, B, and C. As described below, companies have entered the evaluation process on varying timelines, resulting in staggered advancement. Okay, so during the six-month stage A, and let's go down to what these stages are, stage A describes a utility-scale quantum computing concept that has a plausible plan to realization in the near term. So basically, you are a quantum computer builder, you come to DARPA, you spend six months answering every question they can throw at you and beat the crap out of you. And at the end of all of it, they say, actually, there's some merit, there's some value. Uh, what you're building could work and could solve real problems. And then you advance to stage B, which is a rigorous one-year plan. Stage B describes a research and development plan capable of realizing the utility scale quantum computer, the risks associated with that plan and the plan mitigation risk steps and the prototypes needed to burn down these risks. So basically they're getting the meat and potatoes, you've opened the kimono and they're taking a look at your quantum computing design and they're actually trying to figure out if it's gonna work or not. And then stage three is work with the government to verify and validate that the utility scale quantum computer concept can be constructed as designed and operated as intended. Meaning they're actually going to watch you run it they're going to test it with objective problems to verify if it actually works or not. Okay, so uh, I have some videos I'm going to show you guys. And let me go ahead and see if we can get this running. And, and let's make sure that the audio is working real quickly. So I'm going to kill that share. And this is the program manager of the DARPA program. Okay. Also share system audio. There we go. 10 smartest physicists that I know. I would say half of them are convinced that quantum computing is going to be the best thing since sliced bread. This is going to be the technology of the 21st century. And the other half are convinced that even if you could build a quantum computer, which you definitely won't be able to do, it's never going to be more useful than your laptop is for anything that matters. There's a huge gap there between most useful technology ever and totally useless. A lot of the work we've been doing over the last few years has started to convince me that maybe, just maybe, there is a path to make really useful quantum computers in the near future. To figure out if that's true or not, DARPA wants to answer two really fundamental questions. The first question is, if I had a really powerful quantum computer, what could I do with it? And how transformative would that be? The second is, is there a commercial company or an academic group or really any group that has a path to really build that kind of machine in the near term, you know, in the next 10 years? If the answer to both of those questions is yes, that's really an earthquake in how we understand the technology advancement path. If it's really possible to build one of these and it really could be transformative, uh, that has profound implications for policy. If it turns out, as a, as a lot of us suspect, 
that that's really not possible and it really won't do something useful or there isn't a path. We need to know that too, so we can be better planning our basic research funding going forward. And so DARPA is launching something called the Quantum Benchmarking Initiative. This is a major new government program that DARPA is spearheading to try to do exactly that. It is really hard to evaluate a top flight quantum computing company and to see if their approach really holds water, if they can really make it the distance to build an industrially useful machine in the near term. But we are going to build that world-class verification and validation team. And we really want to invite all comers, US and foreign companies, to come in if you think you have what it takes to get through our extraordinary verification and validation team, we would really like to hear from you. Is the hype real? Is quantum computing gonna change everything? Or is this really overblown? And this is more of a basic science question that isn't gonna come to fruition until 2050 or 2060. That's an incredibly important question for the United States to answer. And, and at DARPA, we believe that we can answer that question. Okay, so basically uh, the, let me go ahead and stop sharing. So basically what uh, he, Joe is talking about as the program manager is DARPA was tasked by the US government of actually separating fact from fiction about quantum computers. Are they real? Do they work? And what can you actually do with them? What can't you do with them? Because a lot of marketing speak. So they set up the most rigorous program in history across any government to verify this. And so we have right now um, 11 companies that have survived the first stage of this process. They went through a brutally rigorous six month process and now they're in stage B. And stage B is one year long and it's gonna determine whether uh, they actually think they have something real or not. And the stage C is the verified actually solve the problems that they said they're going to solve. So here's a list of the 11 companies and uh, some are in my backyard and some are global. And what's really cool about quantum computing is there's no canonical approach for quantum computing. In fact, I'm gonna show you another thing real quickly. There is actually already five different approaches that they're taking with sub approaches in each. So you have Atom Computing in Boulder, Colorado, uh, Derac, you have IBM, INQ, Nord Quantique, Photonic, Quantinium, they have Quantum Motion, uh, Q-Era Computing, Silicon uh, Quantum Computing, and Xanadu. And actually, I have over here, I said, hey, look, can you give me a, like a beginner's guide to kind of explain the different approaches that people are using? So uh, Adam, for example, is using this concept of a neutral atom approach. And it says highly focused lasers known as optical tweezers are used to grab individual atoms and arrange them in precise one, two, and even 3D arrays inside an ultra high vacuum chamber. That's pretty crazy. You have silicon based approaches. So you make it like you make normal chips but with some very specialized properties. You have superconducting approaches. Uh, so IBM and Google is doing this, uh, Regetti, NordQuantique, uh, and others. And then they have trapped ion approaches. This method uses individually charged atoms as qubits suspended in a vacuum by electromagnetic fields. And they even have light-based approaches. That's what Sanadu is doing. So photonic quantum computers guide light through tiny pathways, waveguides etched into specialized chips and quantum information is encoded in the properties of the photons, uh, such as their polarization uh, or which path they take and calculations performed by inferring the beams of light, like ripples crossing in a pond and measuring the resulting pattern. So really crazy top shelf stuff and really amazing stuff. But these 11 companies, they all have something working, not only in a lab, but a plan for scale. And they have a class of problems they want to solve with these devices. So uh, next year, B will validate these 11 companies. And if they survive, they move on to C, which will take one to two years. And then we'll know definitively if there is actually a real plan for a useful quantum computer by 2033. And more will come. But this is the first time anybody has really, as a government agency, come in with the requisite scientific background, the requisite people, uh, the people DARPA, very smart to figure out how to actually verify if these approaches work and they're not just marketing speak. Um, so there's a lot of skepticism about quantum computing. The person running it's actually quite a skeptic. Uh, and it's nice to have that because we all get validation. Okay, so what's this mean for crypto? 
What's this mean for all of us in the industry as a whole? Um, I am of the belief uh, that quantum computers will exist in the 2030s, and they will be able to run Grover's and Shor's algorithm, which means that quantum computers will likely have the ability to compromise classic crypto either partially or completely. What that means is the majority of mainstream cryptocurrencies will be vulnerable if they do not implement countermeasures by that time. And if people are archiving data, there may be some cases where encrypted emails, encrypted payloads that were archived can now be decrypted, even if they're re-encrypted later on with a post-quantum scheme because they have a copy of the classically encrypted payload. So we need to have the ability to protect ourselves as an industry. And the answer is we do have some government standards that NIST came up with called FIPS 203, 204, 205, and 206. And these standards, what they do is they basically give you an array of tools, either lattice-based or hash-based or other, to do encryption, do signatures, and do all the stuff that we need to do in the cryptocurrency space. So we have a great strategy at midnight, and uh, that strategy over time can also work its way into Cardano. And the strategy is to actually highly embrace lattice-based crypto, and we're going to be announcing a program project to change the heart of midnight, Plonk and Halo 2, to a new standard called Nightstream that is relying on lattice-based crypto. And it has all these absolutely amazing new properties uh, that are leapfrogging the state of the art in the industry. And we're going to be co-building this with a lot of large companies uh, through a project at the Linux Foundation. We're going to make that announcement uh, early next year as we pull all the threads together. Uh, but it's a moonshot, but we have eyes on shipping this rather quickly. So next year, as midnight turns on, it'll turn on with Plonk and Halo 2. But we're already pre-designing it to have a drop-in replacement so that the engine of midnight, how it does the zero-knowledge cryptography and the cryptography around that, the basement of it, is going to be post-quantum, which means midnight will be immune to quantum computers well ahead of the 2033 deadline that DARPA is setting uh, for all these actors as they enter the marketplace. And what's nice about it is we're looking at this not as a cost center, but at an advantage. Turns out that lattices in particular have capabilities above and beyond what Ethereum is doing in the hash space space. And there are ways to connect lattices to what's going on in the AI space with tensors which means that we can use GPUs to accelerate the writing of a proof, the uh, verification of a proof, the creation of proof and the verification of proof. And you don't have to create custom chips like Ethereum is proposing. You just use the AI chips that are in your phone, your laptop, your desktop computer, and your server, and you can get linear scale. So it's probably one of the most exciting pieces of research that we have because we have to get a really pretty good understanding of how quantum computers work and quantum information theory so we can understand if we built something that's immune to these but the reality is that we all are collectively going to have an answer within two years whether quantum computers are a real thing and they're going to be in market in the 2030s based upon that answer we will already have pre-built the work in anticipation that they are uh, so that uh, midnight can actually be quantum resistant now, what's really cool about that is that Midnight is going to be a folding engine and a recursion engine, unlike any other in the entire private computation space, which means when you directly observe a blockchain, eventually there'll be a path to not only observe it, but fold it, which means Midnight can create some of the best and lightest weight state proofs of every system it's connected to, Cardano, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana, and so forth. What that means is that Midnight can be a proof engine over time to not only verify the state of these systems, but provide people access to that and sign those payloads with post-quantum signatures, which means its view of the system cannot be corrupted by a quantum computer. This allows you to have a post-quantum checkpoint for Bitcoin and for other systems. So even if a quantum computer tries to change the state of things, on midnight, you're going to have a rollback mechanism. You'll have the ability to know what actually happened inside that system before the quantum computer tried to change its state. This is the first step in achieving quantum resistance. There are many other things you have to do, 
uh, you have to look at post-quantum VRFs and post-quantum VDFs, and you have to look at post-quantum random number generation and a litany of other concerns. And the good news is there's tons of great cryptography and technology to do these things. But the most important step is to lock truth, lock history in a state where quantum computers can't break it. And we're making big bets on lattices. So we're really excited to bring that to bear. And there's some phenomenal partners that are coming in, names you heard of. They, they run your laptop. Um, so we're real happy to be part of those groups and they have some of the best scientists in the world. And we're really excited to be working with the Linux Foundation and Centralized Trust um, to have the Nightstream project. And that project will continue to grow and accelerate over time. Uh, but it's really cool that everybody's starting to get their stuff together. Every year, the quantum computing space uh, is massively evolving. They're inventing new things like time crystals and completely new exotic matters and physics. Uh, it's uh, an all-you-can-eat brain trust of some of the smartest people in the world doing some of the most interesting work in physics, material science, electrical engineering, mathematics, and computer science. And as a result, we've gotten to a point where we're now asking the serious question, is this real? Will this actually change the world? And this great program from DARPA, uh, QBI, is going to answer that for us. I believe that the answer will be yes, and I believe the answer will be in the 2030s. Uh, but if we're wrong, well, that's okay, because we've learned a lot. And actually, what we can do long term with lattices is unify on chain and off chain and bring the world of fully homomorphic encryption into the privacy enhancing technology space of blockchain technology. So we get a consolation prize, worst case scenario, and bring the world of AI into the cryptocurrency space and all the acceleration techniques for it into the cryptocurrency space. So there's still a humongous uh, value, whether the quantum computers are there or not, which is why we're pursuing this research agenda. Uh, that said, uh, when we look to the future, if they are real, I'm very glad to say that Midnight will have one of the most holistic, comprehensive quantum strategies, not just for itself, but for the people that build on it and with it in different ecosystems as well. So highly encourage you guys to check out the uh, DARPA QBI page. There's a lovely 40 minute presentation that they've done where they talk about the project goals and there's actually a podcast as well. So I'll go ahead and post a link here for all y'all. And you guys can kind of look at it and follow it along and congratulations to the 11 companies that uh, survived stage A. Uh, these programs are unusually rigorous. They take a lot of effort, a lot of time to get through. And uh, I know how difficult it can be to answer questions about grants or government agencies because we've done it from time to time at IO. And this is a level beyond that. Um, all of these companies are staffed with multi-billion dollar, incredibly brilliant teams, incredibly talented people. And I have no doubt at least one of them will probably produce a working quantum computer by the 2030s. Uh, so do follow along and you guys can see if they survive stage B and then stage C is definitive verification that we will have a working quantum computer by 2030. And we'll know that probably no later than the end of 2027. So the next two years are going to be pretty crazy. Thanks everybody for listening. I figured I'd share this with you. Cheers.